A reading from the Hebrew Scriptures. Hear this, you that trample on the needy and bring to ruin the poor of the land, saying, When will the new moon be over so that we may sell grain, and the Sabbath so that we may offer wheat for sale? We will make the ephah small and the shekel great, and practice deceit with false balances, buying the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, and selling the sweepings of the wheat. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of these deeds. This is the word of the Lord. I stand in this pulpit today deeply grateful for your invitation to come and share the word of the Lord this morning. As someone who works in theological education, I'm I'm just starting my sixth year at Duke Divinity School, I'm deeply grateful for Wilshire's commitment to continuing Dr. Mason's vision of apprenticing the next generation of pastors. This may be our first time meeting in person, but I, I do feel like I know a bit about you from the stories of Lee Curl Dove, who's a former student of mine. Uh, she has borne repeated witness to your love and your mentoring during the worst of the COVID pandemic. And I also feel like I know you through the extravagant hospitality of your ministerial and administrative staff. Um, Debbie Burton is a gem, but I think you know that already, right? (laughs) So thank you for who you are and what you do. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, who came in the person of Jesus Christ, to walk alongside us in the way. Walk alongside us this morning. Open our ears, open our eyes, so that we might leave this place different than we walked in. We would give you praise with all that we are. Show us how. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. So it can take a long time to figure out what we don't know. Our family relocated to the Fijian Islands in 2014 to work at the oldest pastoral training school in that country while local professors finished their training at other institutions. And and we knew when we went that we'd have a lot to learn, but three years later, as we prepared to return to the States, we were continually surprised by how much. We would look at everyday Fijian interactions, and we would think we knew what we were looking at, but most of the time, we didn't know what was at stake. We didn't know the meaning under the surface. We didn't know what we didn't know. Here's an example. Exchanging woven leaf mats. That's that's a really important ritual in Fiji. A, A family gives a mat to another family in moments of celebration or loss, in moments of welcome, in moments of leaving. And and so having mats on hand is an important part of Fijian life. My husband and I started saving the mats that were were given to us because we started doing the math and we knew that a number of students in our weekly small group would be graduating at the end of the year and we wanted to be able to give a mat to each one of them. I mean, we're we're self-sufficient Midwesterners. We wanted to be prepared. We didn't want to be short. And so the mats we received throughout the year started piling up on our back porch until a student kindly informed us that that sort of accumulation even for the purpose of distribution in the future, was bad form. Missed the point. The power of the mat, he said, is in the giving of the mat, not in the mat itself, and we were taking mats out of circulation. Yeah, 
We were stopping their exchange throughout the year. We were thinking about them as objects rather than relationship makers. The more relationships you can make with a mat, the student informed me, the more valuable it becomes. But it doesn't create any relationships if it's stacked on a back porch. We nodded sagely as if we understood, um, but then we voiced a question that made it clear we didn't. Um, what if we give them away, we asked, and then we don't have the mats we need at graduation? He smiled like you would smile at a child that misunderstood something very basic. <laughs> if you give them, they'll return. And if not, you ask a neighbor for help. That's what makes a village strong. What a concept. And what a way to think about money and resources and commodities, not as valuable in and of themselves, but as an opportunity for weaving together a community, for strengthening the ties that bind. It's possible to look at this passage in Amos 8 and think we know just what's going on. I mean, the practices that this prophet describes sound so sadly contemporary, and they're so concrete. It turns out that fraud has a very old history. In Amos's day, there were those who were making the ephah, which is a, a basket that measures grain in volume, a little bit smaller, so that when somebody paid for an ephah of wheat, they got less than they paid for. And there were those who were making the shekel, which is a, a weight measure that determines the worth of the coins in a buyer's pocket, a little heavier, so the buyer's money was devalued. You know, it might take six coins to make a shekel rather than five. Merchants were putting a thumb on the scales so that what looked fair wasn't actually fair at all. And were still, even though they knew the system was rigged, lenders were selling people into indentured labor because poor people couldn't pay off their debts, even when that debt amounted to little more than a pair of shoes. And then Amos gets to that detail about farmers selling the sweepings of their wheat in verse 6. Leviticus 23.22 tells God's people, when you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap all the way to the edges of the field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Leave them for the poor and the resident alien. A, a number of scholars believe that to maximize profits, farmers in Amos' time were pocketing that margin. They were selling the sweepings instead of leaving the sweepings of one's grain in the field to be gathered and used by the immigrant and the landless poor. Okay, so don't cheat. That's a good takeaway from this passage. Don't lie. Don't put undue penalties on people when they get into debt. Don't scrape so much profit for yourself that people who don't own land or just moved here don't, don't have anything to live on. Amos breaks it down, and I'm glad he breaks it down. I've been humbled this year to be walking alongside a, a woman who's reentering the workforce after being incarcerated. And I've seen the discrimination she's faced, how everything is harder for her because she's poor, because she doesn't have credit, because she can't get time off, because she works two shifts, because apartment buildings won't rent to her even after she's been promoted in her job three times and has great references and, and has all the money she needs. You know, I, I finally called an apartment manager to advocate on her behalf and the manager told me that it was the policy of the building not to rent any formerly incarcerated person until they had been out of prison seven years. What's this woman supposed to do, I asked. I mean, she's, she's doing everything right. She's working around the clock. Where is she supposed to live? It's not my problem, the manager said. And to that manager, Amos replies, oh, yes, it is. That final verse in our reading today, well, leaves a chill in the room. I will never forget any of their deeds, God says, speaking of those who've mistreated the poor. That's a sentence that should give every person who reads it pause. And it, it makes one wonder 
why this matters so much to God. This, this God, who our scriptures tell us forgives iniquity and remembers our sin no more. I mean, why is this different? Maybe there's something going on in that passage that we've forgotten, something under the surface that we're not seeing, something that we don't know that we don't know. I wonder if we miss this passage's deeper call when we only use it as a prohibition against wrongdoing. Because Amos 8 is about more than the rejection of cruelty, be it the cruelty of false ledgers or cut corners or locked bars. Such rejections are crucial, but there is more to which this passage calls us. It calls us to embrace. In every prohibition in this passage, there is the expectation of an alternative that addresses us, rich, poor, employer, employed, unemployed. And the expectation is this, God has something to do with our money. And our money has something to do with God. That foundation shapes Amos's critique of God's people from the very start. In, in verse 5, before that vendor cheats and scrimps and, and schemes against his neighbor, he ignores the implications of worship for commerce. He resents the fact that the worship of God is, is impacting his bottom line. Did you, did you catch that? When will the Sabbath be over so we can sell grain, he says. I mean, he's not joyfully present in worship, connecting his mind and his heart, right, to that practice. He's not laughing with children or enjoying the evening meal. He's certainly not asking God to sift the wheat and the chaff in his heart. He's quite certain that faith should have no bearing on business. Well, Amos 8 assumes that the life of faith is tied to the work of life. I want to say that again. Amos 8 assumes that the life of faith is tied to the work, the financial decisions, the buying, the selling, the investing of our lives. Now, it's possible to preach this passage as if money were the problem. But Amos doesn't condemn commerce. He assumes commerce. He condemns false balances and placing profit over righteous relationships between people. Embedded in every condemnation is an assumption that there's a better way. Amos tells us that God cares about our money and, and not just the, the bills that are going to be put into that offering plate when it goes by. God cares about money well used in the world, money that speaks a testimony like those Fijian mats, right? Money that creates life-sustaining relationships. Now, sometimes that means that we intentionally make financial decisions that don't maximize our profit. Financial decisions that are hard. There's a kind of fish in, in Fiji called the kaukaua fish. It's everybody's favorite. can earn a nice sum at the market. And, and there's an easy time of year to catch them <laughs> during their, their breeding season. Kaukaua is a kind of grouper, so when they breed, they group. And uh, they come into the coral reefs. They swim slow. They're heavy with meat. They're easy pickings. But if villages overfish during the breeding season, kakawa disappear. So churches in Fiji proposed a ban. No fishing for a kakawa during those breeding months. A kakawa fast was instituted, even though they were an after-church uh, staple uh, at, the, at the weekly dinner. It was a matter of foregoing short-term economic profit and, and a delicious meal for the sake of long-term sustainability and the health of the reef. And for some local fishermen, that ban was a costly act of worship, an economic testimony to God's decision to create a covenantally connected world. I think that word, covenant, is finally why our economic testimony matters so much to God. 
The decisions we make about our finances are some of the most public testimonies we make about God's covenantal character and, and vision. I'm going to take you back for a moment to Genesis 9:10, but it's a story I'll bet you know. It's one of the Bible's truly astounding verses, though it's, it's one of the hardest for churches in the West to understand. It comes right after the Genesis flood, which you remember. It comes right before God puts that rainbow in the sky. And, and in that verse, God establishes a covenant with every human, every animal, every living thing, all flesh on earth. Now, get what that means. God establishes a relationship of, of faithful love, not just with you and with me, but with us. And not just with us, but with them. And not just with them, but, but the flesh and the life and the earth that sustains and supports them. God is being crafty here, I think, or maybe just deeply wise. Because in making a relationship with all flesh, God doesn't just connect us to God's self. God connects us to each other. Which brings me back to those sweepings. Why does selling the sweepings of the wheat in verse 6 matter? I mean, nobody's lying there. Nobody's cheating. I mean, why not take all the margin that you can? It's your field. It's your grain. You planted it. You get to sell it. Not so, says Amos. Because God's economy... It's about more than fairness. It's about covenant. Sweepings of grain left in a field for those who have no field of their own tells the world we are connected to each other because God is connected and committed to every one of us. Our faithfulness with those sweepings tells the truth of our lives and it testifies to who we believe God is. And sometimes that that testimony get, gets lived out very concretely. The Society of, of St. Andrews responds to Leviticus's command to leave gleanings in the field by actually going into fields today and handpicking the vegetables that are left behind by harvesting machines and delivering them to local food banks. Churches do a lot of that concrete, making sure people have food sort of testimony. But sometimes that testimony requires us to face injustices that we haven't acknowledged before. Sometimes that testimony presses us to imagine a new way of living. The Prime Minister of Barbados, Mia Motley, has been working to diminish her nation's international debt for years, despite the fact that this Caribbean nation keeps getting hit with increasing regularity by extreme storms and, and hurricanes. These are climate disasters that have been caused by, by richer developed nations. But Barbados is the one paying the price. Speaking at the World Trade Organization in March of this year, Motley called the world to account in words that sound decidedly like our passage today. We are more concerned with generating profits, she says, than saving people. And that's perhaps the greatest condemnation that can be said of our generation. Now, this is not a matter of economic ideology. It's a call to relationship. And all over the world, there are similar stories, countries that have the least to do with the emissions that, that melt our ice caps, are the countries that are facing the consequences. So Kiribati, which is an, an island I'm more familiar with in the South Pacific, it will soon have the entirety of its fresh water contaminated by the salt in rising tides. What will its people do? And, and what are we going to say to the God who pledged covenantal loyalty to them? Amos 8 shows us a microcosm of the world and then tells us a truth that we didn't know we'd forgotten. We can hoard the sweepings of our, our fields until they rot in piles on our back porches, or we can create ties that bind. What will we choose? Will we squirrel away our, our sweepings, or will we be swept 
once more into the wide, wild current of God's love. Will we allow God to hallow our sweepings and hallow us, trusting in God's ability to weave together the world? I know it is a strange decision for a guest preacher to come into a congregation she doesn't know and speak about money. Money conversations are tender, contextual conversations. They require nuance and, and more wisdom than most preachers have, maybe more than I have. But I've risked it today, not just because this passage was in the lectionary, but because I believe in the good work of Wilshire Baptist Church. I see the ways that you form new leaders. I see the ways that you encourage the wideness of God's mercy. And I know you are in a time of transition, in a season of national anxiety. And so I bring this sermon to you today not to scold, but to encourage. In a time when it would be easy to convince yourself to pull back into silos of waiting and to store away your resources on the back porches of your bank accounts to, to, to save them away for some future good. I tell you what our Fijian friend told us. Don't take your gifts out of circulation. Lean into relationships. Lean into covenant. Commit to this community through your time and your treasure and your prayer. Your gifts will grow in value every time you give them because value is not inherent in the gift. Value is created in the giving. Your money is a relationship maker, and the more relationships you make, the stronger the village. My husband was, was almost 50 years old when we returned from Fiji, and he didn't know how to celebrate that milestone birthday. We had moved around so much, it felt like the mat of his relationships and vocation was fraying, maybe even unraveling, by all of that change. Here we were, middle of our lives, starting all over again in Durham, North Carolina. But then he got an idea. What if for his 50th birthday, he asked people far and near to help him outfit a refugee home? So everything, top to bottom, furniture, kitchen utensils, linens, cleaning supplies. Man, we had a party. And it didn't matter that our, our home was filled with people that we were just getting to know. We were connected through the giving. One month later, we welcomed a family from the Central African Republic, a family with two teenage girls. And, and this fall, one of those girls started school at UNC Greensboro. She wants to be a doctor. But here's what I want you to hear from me today. Here's what I want you to focus on. It was about six months after that birthday party, and my husband opens an envelope that comes to him in a mail, and he finds a check written for no small amount by someone who was at that party. And it was enough to outfit a second home for a second family. That party attendee told him she wasn't really ready for the giving to stop. I want you to know that joy. Yeah. The joy of knowing that even frayed mats can be mended when we share sweepings. You have no idea how God can use a covenantally committed community to change others, to change the world. Injustices named and transformed. Vulnerable people sheltered. Churches waking up to purpose. You don't know what you don't know. But wouldn't it be wonderful to find out? Amen.